Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair, and I am not preaching this morning. It is a pleasure to be joined in this service by our worship associates, Mary Kay Stilwell and Becky Sait. We're also joined today in this video by members of the staff of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Our membership and admin coordinator, Kelly Ross, is hosting the call and coordinating technology for us. Our music director, Bob Fusen, has worked hard this week to take piano tracks from Bill Carpenter, vocals from Julie Ennerson, uh, uh, offering from the choir that we'll see at the end that we are all super excited about on this end. Um, our religious education director, Chelsea Krafka, is here. Our administrative director, Gene Helms, is here. Several of us are in the chat room running next to the video as it premieres on Sunday. We also have lay pastoral care folks on call this morning. So if you need somebody to talk to, reach out and we will get you in contact with one of them. We're still practicing this new way of being together. It's a time of anxiety in the world and it's a time of possibility in the world. We're learning a whole lot about how to be a church and a whole lot has changed. But what does not change is the vision of the church that we are a church that aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. That is a big vision. And we know that creating a loving community begins with welcome. So whether this is your first time joining or your 500th, if you have stumbled onto this YouTube video by accident, or if you have been looking forward to this for days, if you came here hopeful or heartbroken, whatever your age, gender, skin color, whomever you love, you are welcome here. More than ever, it's important that we share the warmth, light, and love of this place. So invite people to be a part of what we're doing. Send them links, invite them in, say this is a meaningful community for me in this time. And I think it might be for you too. This is not a time to hide who we are and what we're about. I also uh, want to take a moment before we dive into worship to talk for just a moment um, about reopening. There's been a lot of conversation this week about when social distancing restrictions might be lifted, ranging from the head of the CDC saying that there may be a second wave this winter, the governor of Colorado saying he's not sure how schools will come back in the fall. The governor of Nebraska in the last hour before we taped this announcing that some social distancing restrictions in some parts of the state were going to be lifted. There are a lot of really fast moving pieces right now. And the best thing that I can tell this congregation, the best thing that I can tell all of you is that we will continue to monitor the situation with care. That we will depend on the advice of the Lincoln Lancaster County Department of Health. And, and this part is really critical, it is my intention, and I, I think I speak for all of the leadership of the congregation, to err on the side of keeping all of you safe and healthy. So we are going to err on the side of caution because we want you safe, because we want you healthy. We've demonstrated over the last couple months now that we can be a church online. You show that every single time you come to one of these events. Things have changed a lot over the last two months. They are going to continue to change in the months to come. But I know we can do that. It continues to be the most remarkable thing about serving this congregation. You, the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, Nebraska, are prudent and financially conservative in the best way. You decided not to take out loans to do a renovation a couple years ago. You are the best of Midwestern pragmatists. And, and you're also willing to embrace deep fundamental change when needed. When we think about churches, those two things are not supposed to go together. It is remarkable to find a church 
so well established in who it is and so ready to embrace change when needed. You are remarkable people and each of us in this call are lucky to serve here. And that will remain the case as long as we are online, in person, or in some hybrid between the two. But for now, we are online. So, as we enter into worship, take a moment to center yourself wherever you are. Find a comfortable space. Take a few deep breaths. And we begin by lighting our chalice. We light this chalice for the web of life which sustained us, for the sacred circle of life in which we have our being, for the earth, the sky, above and below, and for our Mother Earth, and for mystery. Our opening hymn is number 298 in the gray hymnal, Wake Now My Senses. through the month of April, we've been talking about liberation. And that has been a strange theme to hold in this moment when we're doing such intense work of social distancing. It's also a compelling theme given the sequence of holiday, holy days throughout the last three weeks. Easter, which celebrates the triumph of love over death, Passover, marking the liberation of a people from slavery, and Earth Day, the hope of liberation in this last holiday. 
50 years of Earth Days now. And the day has come a long way since I was in school at a progressive elementary school in a university town. Every year we celebrated with plays about the rainforest and uh, the whole student body joined in singing We Are the World. Earth Day seems more melancholy now. We have, collectively, humanity, done terrible things to the planet we live on. And to me, it's impossible to pull apart the environment from every other intersecting issue. To speak of Earth Day now, we also speak of poverty, of self-determination for people of color and indigenous communities across the country and world. And yes, now, the intersection of public health and conservation. But the Holy Day is not simply one of lamentation. The poet says we must praise the mutilated world, that even in the midst of brokenness, there is beauty and hope and joy. Try to praise the mutilated world, the poet Adam Zajewski writes. Remember June's long days, and wild strawberries, drops of wine, the dew, the nettles that methodically overgrow the abandoned homesteads of exiles. You must praise the mutilated world. You watched the stylish, stylish yachts and ships. One of them had a long trip ahead of it, while salty oblivion awaited the others. You've seen the refugees heading nowhere. You've heard the executioners sing joyfully. You should praise the mutilated world. Remember the moments when we were together in a white room and the curtain fluttered. Return in thought to the concert where music flared. You gathered acorns in the park in autumn and leaves eddied over the earth's scars. Praise the mutilated world and the gray feather a thrush lost and the gentle light that strays and vanishes and returns. There's a, a song that I love that uses that poem. We used it um, at our first Third Thursday service two years ago. And uh, over the Rhine, the, the musicians say, but the poet says we must praise the mutilated world. We're all working the graveyard shift. You might as well sing along. As for your tender heart, this world's gonna rip it, rip it wide open it ain't gonna be pretty, but you're not alone. Because all my favorite people are broken. Believe me, my heart should know. So orphan believers and skeptical dreamers, you're welcome. You're safe right here. You don't have to go. As we sing our next hymn, Spirit of Life, just be present in whatever joy or brokenness you find yourself in this morning. If you're moved, type your name or the one of someone you are holding in your heart into the chat box running next to this video. If you want somebody to talk to, let us know. We have pastoral care folks on call who are happy to sit down with you. Our next hymn is Spirit of Life.
Today's reading is, from, is the first chapter from Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, published in 1962. It is titled, A Fable for Tomorrow. There was once a town in the heart of America where all life seemed to live in harmony with its surroundings. The town lay in the midst of a checkerboard of prosperous farms with fields of grain and hillsides of orchards where in spring, white clouds of bloom drifted above the green fields. In autumn, oak and maple and birch set up a blaze of color that flamed and flickered across a backdrop of pines. Then foxes barked in the hills and deer silently crossed the fields, half hidden in the midst of the fall mornings. Along the roads, laurel, viburnum, and alder, great ferns and wildflowers, delighted the traveler's eyes through much of the year. Even in winter, the roadsides were places of beauty, where countless birds came to feed on the berries and on the seed heads of the dried weeds rising above the snow. The countryside was, in fact, famous for the abundance and variety of its bird life. And when the flood of migrants pour, was pouring through in spring and fall, people traveled from great distances to observe them. Others came to fish the streams, which flowed clear and cold out of the hills and contained shady pools where trout lay. So it had been from the days many years ago when the first settlers raised their houses, sank their wells, and built their barns. Then a strange blight crept over the area and everything began to change. Some evil spell had settled on the community. Mysterious maladies swept the flocks of chickens, the cattle and sheep sickened and died. Everywhere was a shadow of death. The farmers spoke of much illness among their families. In the town, the doctors had become more and more puzzled by new kinds of sickness appearing among their patients. There had been several sudden and unexplained deaths, not only among adults, but even among children who would be stricken suddenly while at play and die within a few hours. There was a strange stillness. The birds, for example, where had they gone? Many people spoke of them, puzzled and disturbed. The feeding stations in backyards were deserted. The few birds seen anywhere were moribund. They trembled violently and could not fly. It was a spring without voices. On the mornings that had once throbbed with the dawn chorus of robins, catbirds, doves, jays, wrens, and scores of other bird voices, there was now no sound. Only silence lay over the fields and woods and marsh. On the farms, the hens brooded, but no chicks hatched. The farmers complained that they were unable to raise any pigs. The litters were small and the young survived only a few days. The apple trees were coming into bloom, but no bees droned among the blossoms. So there was no pollination and there would be no fruit. The roadsides, once so attractive, were now lined with browned and withered vegetation as though swept by fire. These too were silent, deserted by all living things. Even the streams were now lifeless. Anglers no longer visited them, for all the fish had died. In the gutters, under the eaves, and between the shingles of the roofs, a white granular powder was still showed a few patches. Some weeks before, it had fallen like snow upon the roofs and the lawns, the fields and the streams. No witchcraft, no enemy action had silenced the rebirth of new life in this stricken world. The people had done it themselves. This town does not actually exist, but it might easily have a thousand counterparts in America or elsewhere in the world. I know of no community that has, not, that has experienced all the misfortunes I describe. 
yet every one of these disasters has actually happened somewhere. And many real communities have already suffered a substantial number of them. A grim specter has crept upon us almost unnoticed. And this imagined tragedy may easily become a stark reality we all shall know. Several weeks ago, Reverend Michelle LaGrave of First Unitarian Church of Omaha reminded us of the importance of story and how it's important that we all help write the story of our time. Our reading today is taken uh, from a story written not too long ago, uh, a story that changed the world with, Rage, with Seek Silent Spring published in 62, as Becky mentioned. Rachel Carson focused the world's attention on the dangers of DDT and other pollutants and their profound effect on the health and well being of creatures of the earth. Her story helped to launch a conversation that, in many ways, led to Earth Day that turned 50 this past week. Although there was celebration this past week, there was also acknowledgement that there is so much work to be done. This morning, I'd like to tell you a story, another story. Once upon a time, at a time before the coronavirus was a part of our story, on December 21st, the day of the winter solstice, I drove to church for my open circle meeting. As I drove, I thought about the sorry state of the world. Earlier in the week, the president had been charged with high crimes and misdemeanors. Just that morning, I read in the newspaper that there were, to quote the Times headline, 95 environmental rules being rolled back under Trump. According to the article, based on research conducted by Harvard and Columbia Law Schools, of the 95 rollbacks, 58 were already completed and 37 were well underway. These rules governed air pollution and emissions, drilling and extraction, endangered species, toxic uh, substances, water pollution, and included pulling out of the Paris Accord uh, designed to curtail worldwide climate change. Lucky for me, there was not much traffic on the road and no ice, nothing to distract me from the woes of the world. As I pulled into the church parking lot, I was pretty much in agreement with my soulmate Eeyore from another story. Could be worse, not sure how. And then I found out. Now, I admit a deep affection for things lost and found, and I always looked forward to glancing in the basket under the coat rack at church just to see what's gone astray. When I was a child, before I could read on my own, my grandfather read aloud from three sections of the Omaha World Herald. He read every day in the late afternoon as soon as he washed up after chores and grandma had started clanging pots in the kitchen for supper. First, he turned to the comics. They were frequently a puzzle to a child of four, but what I loved about them is they made my grandfather, a rather contained man, laugh out loud. Sometimes he'd laugh so hard his eyes would tear and he'd have to get out his big square white handkerchief to wipe them. After the comics, he'd turn the pages with a great deal of paper rattling to the classifieds. First to share the column headed dogs, pets, and rabbits. I was already begging for a horse and I looked forward to a life filled with puppies and guppies and cats of all kinds. Then, with more paper rattling and some folding, too, he turned to Lost and Found, a column always rich in curiosities. I marveled at the numbers of hankies and scarves, umbrellas and tobacco pouches, and I wondered at the number of prayer books and the right or left men's shoes that had been left behind. The story of my childhood takes place in the olden days, or so I'm told by my family, when women of my grandmother's generation still wore gloves shopping downtown, white gloves in summer, black or navy during the winter. 
Many of these gloves, no matter what the season, showed up single-handed at the back of the streetcar, and then a lost notice would appear in the newspaper column. Sometimes there were rewards for special gloves, lacy ones or those of sentimental value. Once a pair of opera gloves was listed as lost on the Dundee streetcar line. My grandfather, after another laugh aloud, and for reasons I did not understand for years, uh, confided in me that opera gloves were particularly valuable because they could sing. Lost and found. On that cold solstice morning, after a week's worth of disappointing news about the world, there I, as I entered the church and went to hang up my coat, there in my earth-friendly church with its ge geothermic, geothermal heating and cooling system, the one that affirms and promotes the sacred teachings of the earth-centered traditions. There, in the white woven basket labeled lost and found, someone had tossed a large world globe toppled on its side, colorful continents threatening to slide beyond the red and blue, the red and white checks into the dark void below. Carson's fable came to mind, the strange blight that crept over the land as though some evil spell had settled on our community. The, straw, the strange stillness, the bird song no longer in the air, a spring without voices, she wrote, and darkness seemed to fall. I didn't spare my open circle friends with the horrors of my find when I reached the library. I was angry, I felt hopeless, and I was heading toward despair. They listened to my litany of the world's injustices and woes. And then they accompanied me back to the coat rack, to the basket, to the world that was lost, and bore witness to my current state of mind. One of my companions documented the symbol of my distress with a photograph. And then we returned to the library to our soul matters packets. The theme for last December, you might remember, was awe, awe in its various forms. Among the questions of the Soul Matter booklet was, who of us wouldn't benefit from a bit of awe every 24 hours? And all I could think of was humbug, to quote a soulmate from a seasonal story. Then someone reminded me of what the packet called 31 Days of Awe, a compilation of video, videos, one for every day of the month. I had just, in fact, watched a week's worth on YouTube over the past several days. The packet likened the videos to advent calendars that some of us had as kids. We peeled back the cardboard door, and what we discovered would transform our entire day. YouTube offered visual meditations on the world's beauty and mystery of dancing and rock climbing, flowers opening and goats gambling, of stars and the slow emergence of butterflies. Someone in Open Circle quoted Rachel Carson. One way to open your eyes is to ask yourself, what if I would never see again? Another quoted Mary Oliver. Let me keep my mind on what matters, which is my work, which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. Would you like to borrow my book, How Lovely the Ruins, Inspirational Poems for Difficult Times, another ask at the close of our time together? As my friend Eeyore also once said, I can't complain, I have my friends. When I returned to the coat rack, I discovered that the basket was not just labeled lost. What I had not taken to heart at first reading was that it was also labeled found. The world could be lost and therefore the world could be found. If you haven't guessed it, this is a story of transformation. Powered by that small, deceptively nondescript three-letter word, and. And offers winter and summer, the known and the unknown, life and death, innocence and growth. And is one of the lessons of the great Sumerian poem, The Descent of Anana, that the UU Women's Gathering just discussed right before the solstice.
the one that tells the story of the goddess queen's descent into the underworld, only to be hung out to dry by her dark sister, Ereshkigal, and then chronicles her grief and her eventual return to the upper world with a more mature sense of the world and her place in it. Or as Virginia Woolf succinctly puts it, a light here requires a shadow there. Rachel Carson used the story of grief rhetorically to sound alarm that we were in the process of losing everything. Um, in saving the songbirds, we would be saving ourselves. She and other writers of the 50s and 60s are celebrated today for calling for a global environmental movement. The actual idea for Earth Day sprang from grief and anger caused by an ecological disaster. As some of you will remember, on January 28, 1969, a well drilled by Union Oil off the coast of Santa Barbara blew. More than 3 million gallons of oil spewed into the ocean, killing over 10,000 uh, 10, seabirds and dolphins and seals and other creatures of the earth and the sky. Environmental Rights Day was celebrated the following year on January 28th. And then the next year, Gaylord Nelson and a Harvard graduate student, Dennis Hayes, founded Earth Day December 20, I'm sorry, April 22nd, 1970. I was living in New York City for the first Earth Day. It was an electrifying day. Streets were filled with citizens who recognized that we need to celebrate and protect our home. We have met the enemy, so said a popular slogan of the day, and it is us. John Lindsay, who was mayor of New York at the time, shut down uh, Fifth Avenue and opened Central Park for the event. It was a joyous day with posters of praise and concerns, citizens sweeping up the streets with brooms and bystanders collecting garbage. Governments followed suit. Secretary uh, of the UN, you thought, proclaimed an International Earth Day. In the, U in the U.S., the EPA was created by executive order, signed by none other than Richard Nixon, another reminder of the power of AND, and the Clean Air Act was extended. Soon followed the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the Federal Water Pollution Control Amendments, the Endangered Species Act, on and on. Uh, that continued to the Paris Agreement in 2016, when the U.S., along with 187 other nations, began to deal with greenhouse gas emissions, migration, and finance. Since then, the environmental movement has taken quite a hit. Uh, the rollbacks, the ones that are completed, the ones in process, how can we move forward this spring when our story includes coronavirus, our hours spent sheltering in place, and learning to cope with what sometimes seems to be overwhelming uncertainty? How are we to move forward? Most of us have heard about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, uh, those that men and women who are dying go through as they approach their end. Less known are John Bowlby's stages of grief that we all go through when, we, when someone we know and love dies, or when we suffer a significant loss of any kind. We experience, Bowlby says, shock and numbness, move on through a period of yearning and searching to despair and disorganization. And if we are fortunate, our grief moves us into a period of reorganization and recovery. Maybe there's something in Bowlby's model that can speak to us now. Maybe every now and then there's need to take time to grieve in a social or collective sense in order to reorganize our efforts to move forward again with renewed hope and determination. The profound loss we are experiencing now, depending on how we write the story, may lead us to make important changes in how we view the planet, our home. Humankind does not have to be the most damaging of all invasive species on Earth, as the LA Times writer put it recently. Satellite images show nitrogen dioxide emissions, 
fading over Italy, Spain, and China. Levels of pollution over New York City have been reduced by 50%. There are blue skies over California. We see the return of wildlife in national parks and local parks alike. We will do well to remember the power of and as we look to the days ahead. On November 4th, 2019, the Trump administration gave a, a formal notice of intention to withdraw US support from the Paris Agreement. And, and we should note, the earliest legal effective withdrawal date, according to the signed accord, is November 4th, 2020, one day after the next presidential election. It is no accident that this week, Dennis Hayes noted in the Times that we should all remember that 2020 Earth Day slogan is vote for the Earth. As I drove home that morning of the winter solstice, I listened to Serene Jones, president of Union Theological Seminary on NPR. How does one move forward with hope? The interviewer asked. Jones quoted South African Afri activist S.A. Sachs. Hope rises like a phoenix, she said, from the ashes of shattered dreams. We often hear from the pulpit, or used to hear from the pulpit at 6300A, and more recently via YouTube and Zoom, the transformation occurs in the, United Ch in the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, where we think, whether we think of it as a brick and mortar church or moved along in packets by internet routers. I believe it does. Grief may be the necessary step, the cocoon between caterpillar and butterfly. Maybe we need to let go of our disappointment over our failures, all that has not been done or undone, and, that word again, and, to show up with renewed energy for the songbirds, ourselves, for our children, to lift the globe with its many countries of many colors from the basket of neglect, that headlines warn us of. Stories we read sometimes have happy endings, sometimes they do not. But our collective human history continues to be written, and it's up to us to do our part in the writing of it. Our vision as Unitarian Universalists is, after all, no less than working to transform ourselves and helping to save our world. Amen. As we move toward the conclusion of our time together, here are a few announcements. As we approach the spring congregational meeting, join us for two town halls on Zoom. The first will be held this Thursday, April 30th at 6 p.m. The second will be Sunday, May 3rd at 11. The Monday e-blast will have links to three adult religious growth and learning classes, which will begin this week. We hope you take the opportunity to learn with these knowledgeable folks. Last week, we launched text giving. We will be using text giving today for the offering plate. As you listen to our final hymn coming up in just a moment, please consider using these instructions that you should see on the screen here to give a donation to the Sunday offering plate today. The Religious Growth and Learning Committee had initially planned a potluck to thank our teachers and assistants this last year. Since that will unfortunately not be happening, we have a request from you. Instead of cooking food, please consider cooking up a sentence or two, thanking our volunteers in your own special way and send your messages to me, Chelsea Krafka. You can find my email on our website if you don't already have it. Finally, our Youth in Action group is sponsoring a church talent show online and has only received one entry. I know you are very talented people, so please submit by video or any artwork by photos through email to Ashley Fusen. You can message me again, my, web, my email found on the website for her email as well. Our concluding hymn today is Keepers of the Earth by Joyce Poli. It is brought to us by the choir of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln with Julie Anderson as our choir director. Bill Carpenter 
played piano and featured our photos by Bob Egan, Harry Hafer, and Lynn Janis. Many, many thanks to Julie Anderson, to our choir, to Bob Fusen, to Bill Carpenter, to everybody who is involved with music in this place. Um, it is an enormous amount of work to put together something like that. And we are, we are blessed by their presence with us. We close our service by extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. <laughs>